Good morning. This morning, our subject of discussion is our real nature. Um, you might think that's always your subject of discussion. <laughs> but the angle I'm going to take today is a part of a new initiative. I'm going to be reflecting upon the Vedantic teachings of Swami Vivekananda in a series of lectures starting today. How I came upon this is, when I was reading the bylaws of our Vedanta society, the first thing it says is, the purpose of this institution is to um, study and uh, teach Vedanta as taught by Vivekananda and the early Swamis. And these bylaws were formulated during the time of Swami Abhedananda, a few years after Vivekananda. You see, we do study Vedanta here, the classical texts. We are studying the Upanishads. Right now we are studying Mandukya Upanishad. We study the Bhagavad Gita. These are the canonical texts of Advaita Vedanta. We study the early masters, Shankara, Vidyaranya, the author of Panchadashi. We are studying texts like Aparoksha Nubhuti and Drigdrishya Vivek and so on. And we must, that is true. But Vivekananda is of special relevance to us. In this center, of course, because this was where uh, Swami Vivekananda first started his work, uh, his organizational work in the West, the first Vedanta society. Um, this was where his classics, Raja Yoga and uh, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga also, were uh, in fact first published from this center. I was reflecting upon that and I was thinking, Notice, why Vivekananda? When you're studying Vedanta, what's the speciality? Why should we focus on Vivekananda? Vivekananda restated in our modern context the ancient teachings of Vedanta. He gave new insights. It's not just he gave the uh, old teachings again. Um, um, what, what's this? Um, the old wine in new bottle. Not just that. But new insights into Vedanta. Vivekananda was very much acquainted with the developments of science in his time, uh, philosophy. He was a man of, of, uh, uh, of the entire world, not just the Indian context. He was a unique synthesis of East and West. So from his, from his perspective, studying Vedanta has, uh, has unique relevance to us. He was the teacher, like his master, Sri Ramakrishna, he was the teacher of harmony. Harmony between reason and religion, so important today. Harmony between the different religions of the world, again of great importance. In fact, last week was declared as the Harmony of Faiths Week by the United Nations, World Harmony of Faiths Week by the United Nations. So, harmony within Vedanta. Many people do not know about the wide range of views within Vedanta which are all conflicting with each other. Non-dualism, qualified non-dualism, dualism. dualism. Uh, there are at least ten major schools of Vedanta. But harmony between, within them, harmony of the different approaches to spiritual life, knowledge and devotion and meditation and service. The four yogas, classical four yogas of Swami Vivekananda. So the teacher of harmony, that's another thing that we gain from studying Vivekananda. And more so, the first thing actually which comes to mind when you study Vivekananda is strength, is life transforming power, an immediate boost to uh, our day to day life. You feel surcharged with positivity, you feel surcharged with strength to live our lives. Um, life transforming power. I'm fully convinced that the power which works through Vivekananda is the power of the avatar of uh, Sri Ramakrishna transmitted through Vivekananda. So these, and there are many other reasons, I was sitting and reflecting, why Vivekananda? So some of these reasons which came to my mind were these, and there are other reasons too. What I will do is take up the, uh, the teachings of Vivekananda, texts, and I will reflect upon them. I'll summarize and talk about them and reflect upon them from our 21st century perspective. This subject which I have got today, our real nature, um, the it's based on a lecture given by Swami Vivekananda, which is included in the Jnana Yoga. It's called The Real Nature of Man. So our real nature also 
um, you know, rule, sort of polishes over the uh, the gender problem there, the real nature of man. <laughs> so, our real nature. We're going to talk about that and reflect upon it. Swami Vivekananda starts with the problem of death. Cheerful note. <laughs> but it is the central problem. I was reading a very interesting book recently. Um, it's called A Brief History of Thought. And it's an introduction to uh, Western thought. Western philosophy particularly, but Western thought. But why is it interesting? There are so many such introductions, and I've read so many other books also, which are introductory books to Western philosophy and more detailed books. But this was different. Why was it different? Well, first of all, it's written by a Frenchman. Uh, Luc Ferry, he is a French philosopher. He was at one time the education minister of France. And he was an, he's a noted philosopher. After starting to read the book, I looked him up on internet, but all the talks there are in French, so I couldn't follow. This is a translation. Being French, he is um, independent. Uh, let's put it that way. There is not a single work of any English author quoted there. <laughs> when you read an introduction to Western philosophy by any English author, British or Australian or American or Canadian, you will find in the recommended reading a list of um, books uh, written by, say, Bertrand Russell and so on and so forth, all the great uh, uh, English philosophers. If you look at the recommended reading at the back of this book, not a single work by any English speaking author. No, there are no philosophers of note in Britain or America or Australia. All the reading is French or German uh, writers and finished. But that's not the point. He starts off, said, when we started learning philosophy, we said, what is philosophy? And he said the standard definition is you know, critical thinking about um, issues of interest. He says that's nonsense. That is not philosophy. Critical thinking about something is, is an essential for any subject. Why just philosophy? And he says, what philosophy really is, is to grapple with the problem of death. How interesting, he says. Here is a person who's mastered the entire Western canon. And as I read the book, it's a beautiful thing, you know, uh, it's really worth reading. Idiosyncratic. I did not agree with quite a bit of what he said, and you will not agree with it if you read it, but still, original and brilliant. He starts off, he says, three things have to be considered when you, when you talk about philosophy or thought in general, human thought. One is theoria, the original Greek word from which theory has come. Um, that was also an eye-opener for me, because theoria means, theo means the ultimate realities. Uh, orao in Greek, apparently, I didn't know that, it means I see. So I see the ultimate truth. And what struck me, I was thunderstruck because the name for philosophy in India is darshana, to see the ultimate realities. And when we studied philosophy, when we were, we were novices, we were taught by our professors for philosophy that, see, Western philosophy and Indian philosophy are different. Indian philosophy is realizing the ultimate truth, um, that is darshana, but Western philosophy is philosophy, a love of wisdom, it's about thinking. No, it's the same thing. It took me 30 years to come to this, and thanks to this person who says the literal meaning of theory and the meaning of the Indian word darshan is exactly the same, literally the same. Theory of one. Number two, he says, we must consider ethics. What is it that we have to do? Theory is, the, is your theory, is your, uh, uh, your speculation about the world, what the world is. What follows from that, second, is ethics. So what do we do about it? That question, what is good and what is bad? And the last one he says, every system of thought must have something to say about what he calls salvation. How does it confront death? What is the solution uh, given by that uh, system of thought about death? The problem of death is fundamental. We may say, no, I don't think about it. Uh, a modern psychoanalyst would say, ah, the more serious problem, suppression, repression. <laughs> You're not thinking about it. You know, when they say, I have no problem, a very serious problem, you are <laughs> repressing me. <laughs> Carl Jung, who also has an interesting history with this center because there's a beautiful dialogue between him and Swami Pavitrananda. If you Google Swami Pavitrananda, Carl Jung, a dialogue about spirituality and psychoanalysis. Um, Carl Jung said, I have seen that most psychopathology, especially in middle-aged people, people after middle age, 
is because of the fear of death. We do not admit it, we do not see it, but it haunts us. Ernst Becker, the classic book, it won the Pulitzer Award, um, The Denial of Death. He says, humanity is, we are haunted by the fear of death. And all our, uh, he calls them immortality projects. He says, most of human culture is a response to this deep-seated fear of death. From having children, to art, to writing books, to founding institutions, um, to science, uh, to making endowments, uh, religion, religion. All of these are responses to the fear of death. How can I exist, continue to exist? Of course, his um, take is that it's doomed to failure. Because you're going to die anyway. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda points out, everybody dies. Saints die and sinners die. Kings die and beggars die. The learned die and the ignorant die. Everybody dies. So this fear of death, what happens? Is this all that there is? Or is there something beyond death? The Kato Upanishad, the little boy who goes to the house of death and asks this question. What happens after death? And he asks death, the final authority. So that's how the Upanishad begins. Every system of thought has to say something about the problem of death. What is your response to it? Um, Another thing is the question of happiness. Even within this life, even before we are dead, we suffer. There is unhappiness. There is uh, dissatisfaction. We want so much and yet we get so little. Um, our senses are limited. We try to enjoy. We want much more happiness. But how much can we eat? How much can you party? How much can one drink? How many movies can you watch? Uh, Somerset mom says, if you single-mindedly chase pleasure, very soon you find nothing pleasing anymore. Uh, Somerset mom. He wrote that book, The Razor's Edge. There is something called the, uh, the uh, hedonist trap. Uh, modern psychology is talking about it. Notice how when you buy something, it may be a gadget, or it may be a house, it may be a dress, whatever you buy, or whatever you go into to enjoy something, the expectation of happiness that we have, and the actual experience, the actual experience we get actually much less happiness than we expected. And this has been, it's not just anecdotal, they have statistical, they have done psychological surveys on it. Ha grade the amount of happiness you expect from this new iPhone. Then you go out and buy it. Then a week later, how much grade it? How much happiness are you getting from that iPhone? Always less than what you expected. <laughs> and uh, modern psychologists say this, is, this has to be so. This is the way nature has programmed us. Why? Why? This expectation of happiness is what makes us do things which nature wants us. To eat and to reproduce and to you know, have families. Nature wants us to do that for the propagation of genes and so on. How will it make us do? By promising pleasure and happiness. But, there's a but included there. If you actually, if nature actually gives us the amount of happiness which seems to be there, we'll be satisfied. We wouldn't want, would want to do that again. So nature gives you some happiness and promises you better luck next time. Try it again. <laughs> Try it again. And we keep trying it. Even after knowing this, I uh, learned it from Robert Wright's book. He's written a book called Why Buddhism is True. So um, he's an atheist. He's a neo-Darwinian. He says, even after understanding all this, I couldn't resist it. That's when I began to look at spirituality, meditation, that it actually enables us to put our insights into practice. The insights I got from positive psychology, from evolutionary psychology, from uh, Darwinism. Those insights, the understanding, that same understanding now I can apply to my life because I'm meditating regularly. So anyway, the problem of happiness, we are unhappy. We are not satisfied. How can we find fulfillment? So these are some great, these are the two great questions. At the back is the great question of death. All ends. So what is the meaning in all of this? And in this life also, when we are here, it's still not very satisfactory. 
Now there are two possible responses to this. One is the ever so fashionable response of um, modernism and postmodernism. During Swami Vivekananda's time, it had already started. He called it nihilism. Nothing can be known. Uh, there's no real answer to all of this. Uh, religion is false anyway. Philosophy never gets anywhere. And science simply just reveals that we are material beings. We are going to perish within a few years. That's it. There's nothing more. So what can you do? There's no point to any of this. That seems to be the answer. And it's become more and more and more fashionable. Nietzsche. That was before Vivekananda. But after that, whether it's Freud or Marx, this, this author whom I was quoting, the French philosopher, he calls them the masters of suspicion. <laughs> that uh, all the idols have feet of clay. You have to question and criticize everything and find that everything is horrible. That's one way. But that is no solution at all. Swami Vivekananda says, it's easy to talk. I've never met a person who's really a nihilist. A real deep thinking nihilist will commit suicide. The myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus, the first sentence, the only serious question facing us is, why should I not kill myself right now? <laughs> he says. And the other way is to have this quest of thought, of, of philosophy, of spirituality. What is the reality about ourselves? What is the reality about uh, life? What is our real nature? Look at ourselves and question. The quest starts. And this quest is what we are going to talk about today. Because there is an answer. There is a solution to it. By the way, uh, the philosopher I was talking about, Luke Ferry, at the end of the book, he considers the four great movements in Western thought. Starts with Greek thought and how it was overwhelmed and replaced by Christian thought. How that was overwhelmed and upturned by modernism. You know, science and rationality and democracy and things like that. Um, how that was again threatened by our, our postmodern thinking. So from Greek thought to Christian thought to modernism to postmodernism. And then he says at the end, um, if you ask me, the solution to the question of death, which one will you prefer? The, and he goes through the answers given by all four. He says, I would definitely prefer Christianity, but except for one thing, I don't believe it. <laughs> he said, I don't believe it. It's not true. And that is the place where most educated, thinking persons are stuck. Religion seems to promise a solution, but how can we believe that if you are... Uh, intelligent and educated and smart and seems difficult to believe. Richard Dawkins was asked once, atheist, militant atheist, <laughs> you keep speaking about atheism, but only a tiny percentage of uh, human beings are atheists. Most people believe in some religion or the other. He said, yes, but if you consider, the, you know, 99% of humanity is, they believe in some religion or the other. But if you consider, say, scientists, in fact, he said there was a poll conducted of Nobel Prize winners. And among Nobel Prize winners living now, more than 90% are atheists. And so he says, yeah, I just leave it to you. What is the conclusion? The smarter you are, the less likely you are to believe in religion. <laughs> the dumber you are, the more likely you are to believe in religion. You decide. The devastating answer. So that is where we are stuck. What is the answer? You see, the great answer provided by Vivekananda and Vedanta is that there is a solution, and a solution that is acceptable, perfectly acceptable to our most modern rational minds. It was for, not for nothing that Nikola Tesla used to come to this Vedanta society to listen to Vivekananda and then to Abhedananda. It was not for nothing, not this building. It was not there at that time. Um, we have it in the lists of people who attended the talks. Uh, it was not for nothing that... Um, William James was attracted at Harvard University. Some of the leading intellects at that time who found it difficult to believe in religion, they found that possibility of real, acceptable, rational spirituality here. So what is this quest? Starts with the body first. What are we? The, qu the question is, what am I? What is our real nature? Is it just this little body? And immediately we see this body is a mass of changes. It is bored and it dies 
And while it is existing, it is changing continuously. From babyhood to childhood to teenage to youth to middle age to old age and death. Is this our real nature? Then we are trapped. We are little bodies born to suffer and then perish in a vast and uncaring material universe. But immediately we notice one thing. All of us, without any religion or spirituality, we notice one more thing. There is a second aspect to our nature. What is that? When we look inside. When we look inside, each of us, when we look inside, we find thoughts, emotions, feelings, memories, desires, ideas. The inner person, the first person experience. Now Vedanta makes a distinction between these two. The outer shell called the physical body or the gross body. Our early Swamis translated the Sanskrit sthula sharira into gross body. Not knowing what the meaning of the word gross would change in America over the, over the years. But gross body simply means physical body. The other term, the, the name for our inner person is sukshma sharira, the subtle body. A body where, where we, we look inside. Why would you distinguish between the two? Clearly you have to distinguish between the two. Because the physical body is a public entity which is visible to the doctor. It can be measured and weighed and identified. It is the one which is named and which is located in time and space. Here you are in the Vedanta society in that particular chair. It's a physical entity in a physical universe. And this internal thing going on, first person experience, is not like that at all. No scientist in the world, no doctor in the world has direct access to your thoughts unless that person is a telepath. <laughs> Only you have direct access to your thoughts, feelings, memories. Is it not true? Immediately the question will be, and it's amazing if you read the original text which I'm talking about, uh, um, The Real Nature of Man, Swami Vivekananda anticipated these questions. The question immediately will be, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This physical body, the brain and nervous system are producing what you are calling the subtle body. Your thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories, they are all in the brain and they are produced by the brain. They are not anything separate. Don't make them separate. This is a trick. This is we are, where we are right now. It's, it's called the, the hard problem of consciousness. David Chalmers right here. I'm sorry for bringing it up ad nauseum, but it's very interesting. More than 125 years after Swami Vivekananda, uh, who raised this in, in, in this particular talk itself. Prove it that the mind and intellect and memories are generated by the brain. Prove it. How? Where is the connection? The last thing that... A per there's a correlation, remember. There's a correlation. When I'm thinking something, feeling something, imagining something, remembering something, or failing to remember something, there's an electrical activity going on in my brain. No doubt about that. There's a correlation. But modern neuroscience, which is uh, talking about the mind and the brain, it's a science of correlations. You report something. And I, the doctor, I'm entirely dependent on your reporting. Unless you report a thought or a feeling, I can't do anything. At the most, I can do an fMRI scan. I can see that something is happening in your brain. Where science is stopping and is bound to stop is with the brain, with the, with the delicate electrical activity in the neurons of the brain. Science is bound, in principle it is bound to stop there. Where can it go after that? Where can it go after that? That's the only physical thing there. Science has to stop with the physical and yet what you are talking about is not physical. What are you reporting? A pain. What are you reporting? A smell, a taste, a touch, a memory. You are not reporting a burst of electricity. The two things are different. And it's not, I'm not saying it to make a case for spirituality. In NYU right now, David Chalmers is saying and is making a huge mess out, out of uh, modern uh, uh, psychology and philosophy and neuroscience. It's a huge controversy raging right now. If you Google it, the hard problem of consciousness. 125 years ago, Swami Vivekananda, you'll see there's a passage there in that where he says, what comes first? What is the link between mind and, and the brain? So, the subtle body is not exactly the physical body. There's a link between the two, definitely. Just as the software is not exactly the hardware. Um, 
if your computer crashes, your data is backed up to the cloud, so it's still there. It's not the same thing exactly. Though it uses the hardware to work. Without the hardware, you cannot access it. We were reading the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna a few days ago here, and a devotee, Sham Basu, he asks Sri Ramakrishna this very question. Sir, what is the subtle body? Can it be demonstrated that when the physical body dies, the subtle body exists and goes on? See, the question is, when he is asking what is the subtle body, we might say, but don't you feel it? Don't you have thoughts, feelings, emotions? We just learned from the Vedanta society, that's what's called a subtle body. Yes, but his question is sharper than that. He is ask, asking, are they really separate? And the proof that they are really separate is when the physical body dies, the subtle body should continue to exist. That is where, right now, spirituality and uh, mainstream materialist science will not agree. Materialist science will say, we can't explain it, but give us time. It's called promissory materialism. I promise I will explain it, but give me 20, 25 years. Vedanta says, you cannot explain it in this way unless there is a paradigm shift in science. Why? Because it's not one more material thing requiring an expl explanation. We'll go into it later in the question answer session, but let me go ahead with the talk. And Sri Ramakrishna's answer to Shambhasu was, uh, first he scolded him. He says, uh, a true spiritual seeker has no interest in demonstrating these things to you. He wouldn't care a fig whether you uh, accept his, his conclusions or not. And then he goes on to explain what is the subtle body. And Vedanta has a very clear classification of the subtle body. If you understand this, remember this is not speculation. Immediately do a checklist within yourself. Just as I say you have hands and feet and a head and a tummy and you look at it and you tick, yes, yes, check. Uh, it's, not, it's not theory, uh, not philosophy or speculation. Similarly, check the subtle body here. The subtle body, according to Vedanta, has actually 19 parts in one way of classification. The way it is put is the five sense organs, not the physical organs. The powers of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, the five motor organs, uh, walking, grasping, things like that. Um, the five pranas, pancha prana, the physiological functions uh, which keep this physical body alive. But most importantly, and Sri Ramakrishna mentions only the last four, mind, intellect, ego and memory. Mano buddhi chitta hankara. This is the subtle body. Check. Do I have thoughts? Unless I am a zombie, I have got thoughts. Do I have memories? Of course. Do I say I? I just did. <laughs> that I is the ego. So memory and thoughts and emotions and intellect and understanding, all of this, it's there. That's the subtle body. Clearly there. Swami Vivekananda points out that the first step in religion was the discovery that there is this thing uh, the ancients used to call it in different religions that there is a bright body. Here is a body which dies and there is a bright body. There is a subtle body which continues to exist after death. That is the beginning of religion. Going back to prehistoric times. Notice one thing common to all religions of the world. They all believe in an afterlife. Every religion. You cannot have religion without an afterlife. But you ask afterlife of what? Not afterlife of the body. The body is burnt or buried and decomposing, it's gone. After life, every religion will say, after life of the soul, of course. But then what is the soul? It can't be the body. If the body is gone, then what remains? What continues after the body is gone, that is the one which has the afterlife. And that is what Vedanta calls the subtle body. So this is the big claim. So far, science will not sign off on this. But they cannot explain it either. So that's the thing. Uh, the subtle body continues to exist. Sukshma Sharira continues to exist after death. Even religions like Buddhism and Jainism, which do not talk about God, they talk about an afterlife. They talk about a subtle body, Sukshma Sharira. So subtle body continues. The most prehistoric religions, there also you find burial customs and the idea of that there is some kind of a ghost or something like that. Uh, ancestors accept offerings. Most primitive of religions also have this concept of something beyond the physical body. 
in early uh, forms of religions, they used to think that the subtle body and the physical body retain a connection. So it's important to bury the physical body, to put it in a pyramid or a tomb or something like that. But very soon you realize that the soul which departs, the subtle body which goes on, has no interest in the physical body. So you need not keep it. It's, it's not particularly important to preserve it perfectly and keep all sorts of food and drink at Kings were buried with their servants, poor servants, you know, <laughs> so, so they can serve the uh, uh, subtle body of the king. Um, Vedanta says, notice one thing about the subtle body. It's also a body. It's not you. It also encases you. Notice that the physical body is a stream of changes. Um, classical Vedanta or Sanskrit literature talks about the sixfold changes. It is born. Jayate. And being born, it comes into existence. Asti. You put your name on the census, a baby is born. And then Vardhate, it develops, matures. And then Viparinamate, it re reaches a, a mature state, a middle age, where a plateau is reached. And then, unfortunately, <laughs> Apakshiyate, ages, deteriorates. And then finally, Nashyati. Uh, dies, is destroyed. Sixfold changes. It talks about sixfold changes uh, in classical uh, Sanskrit literature. The body undergoes sixfold changes. The mind waxes and wanes. In Swami Vivekananda's own language, he says, the mind waxes and wanes too. How much the mind changes in the course of one day, this morning, from morning when you woke up till now, how many times happy, how many times irritated. How many times bored? How many times curious? How many times uh, 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 eager? Uh, how many times frustrated, desiring, um, uh, satisfied? Mind. How many times you remembered things? How many times you tried to remember and forgot? Within one day, in half a day, the mind has undergone so many changes. And imagine our minds when we were teenagers. Imagine our minds when we were little children. What we liked, what we thought, what we wanted. And we cannot even imagine the mind when we were babies. It would be an alien mind to us. The mind changes so much. And yet, I am the one which was in that baby body, in the child's body, in the young person's body. I am the one who had the mind of the baby and the child and the teenager and this mind. From the morning till now, so many changes. I am the one who was happy, who was irritated who was excited, who was bored, curious. Which mind am I? You see, all of them. Yeah. So if they change, then I'm changing continuously. But we don't think of ourselves as that. We think of ourselves as a subject who experiences boredom, excitement, anger, peace. Isn't that how we experience ourselves? Then what is the nature of the subject, irrespective of the changes of the mind, irrespective of the changes of the body? What is the nature of that subject? Vedanta says the body, physical body is also a body, a shell, a hard shell encasing you. A limitation. The mind is also a softer shell, a subtle shell encasing you. These are what we experience. We are none of them. Vedanta is full of uh, very sharp analytical tools, tools to separate you. Don't worry, not physically separate you. Analyze and see that you are actually not the body or the mind. For example, nitya anitya. Anitya means that which is impermanent. Body is born and it dies. So, and I am the same one who observes uh, who uh, was there before, hopefully, the birth of the body and who will continue after the death of the body. Uh, the continuous change of the body, savikara and nirvikara. The body changes. I am the unchanging observer, experiencer of a changing body. The mind changes. Savikara and nirvikara. Savikara means the mind is subject to change and modification continuously. I, the observer, I do not change. You will follow carefully. You will say that I change. No. You only change. What are the changes? If you enumerate your changes, what you subscribe to yourself. You will see that's a change of the body. I was so slim and fit, now I've put on weight. Body. 
I was so energetic. Now I feel tired easily. Prana, the vital forces. I used to remember my memory was just like that, sharp. And now I can't remember, recollect so well. Memory, mind. I am the same experiencer of all of these. Of the healthy body, of the failing body, of the sharp memory, of the uh, faint memory. I am the experiencer of all of these. I am not them. I am not literally them. No more than I have a, a cloth here and a shirt within. I am not the cloth. I am not even the shirt. Then what am I? I am the unchanging observer of a changing body mind. I am the experiencer, drashta, of things which are experienced, drishya. Note this, a very subtle point. The mind changes, we, are, we experience it. So the mind is an object of experience. The body changes, we experience it. The body is an object of experience. Object of experience is called drishya, what you see. And you, the experiencer, you are called drashta, seer. The knower, experiencer, seer. Drashta and drishya, they cannot be the same thing. Changing and unchanging, they cannot be the same thing. Another difference, another an analytical tool. Consciousness and its objects. On which side is consciousness? You are experiencing the world now. You are aware. Is awareness there or say here? You are watching this. Where is the awareness? You will say, I, here. Take it one step further. Look at the body. I am experiencing the body. I am seeing it. I am touching it. Where is the awareness? Here or there? I am aware of it. Do you understand the question? You ask a simple question. Who is aware? Am I aware of the hand or is the hand aware of me? Is it saying hello? <laughs> How is it going? No. That would be so, so weird. We don't even consider. It's a simple fact. But we don't notice it. We don't notice it. Vedanta is, it draws our attention to what Swami Vivekananda had another talk, the open secret. It's right here. Not before our noses, behind our noses. <laughs> it's right there. But we don't notice it. Consciousness is always on your side. Not on the side of the object. Now apply this. Is the body an object or not? Yes. I can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. It's an object. Is the mind an object? Yes. When there is happiness, are you not aware that you are happy? When there is pain, do you not feel it? Yes. When you remember or try or forget, trying to remember that experience, are you not experiencing it? Yes. Then experience is on your side, consciousness is on your side, not on the side of the mind. I always give a simple thought experiment, you can try it, it but the result is stunning. Think a simplest thought, 2 plus 2 is 4. If you're thinking that, now ask yourself a question right there. What is conscious? Am I conscious of 2 plus 2, 4? Or is 2 plus 2, 4 conscious of me? So obviously I'm conscious of it. It's a thought. That means the thought is not conscious. You are conscious of the thought. You say, so, so you have taken a step which most philosophers and scientists today are confused about. They cannot distinguish between mind and consciousness today. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. You have just now demonstrated a thought is an object, a mind is an object, consciousness is apart from that, is the experiencer of that object. It's like a light shining on an object. This, what is this? You will say it's a clock in your hand. But it's actually light reflected of the clock in my hand which is going into your eyes. You are ex experiencing reflected light. Similarly, consciousness shining on the object gives you the experience of the object. You are that consciousness and the object is, an, is something that you experience apart from you, including the mind, let alone the body. Even the mind is not you. We are not bound by the body. We are not bound by the mind. The conclusion of this is grand. If you apply these analytical tools, three I've given you. Uh, Savikara, Nirvikara, changing, unchanging. I, the unchanging experience, changing body, mind. Second, Drashta and Drishya, I the experiencer, experience mind and body as objects. Chit, Jada, consciousness and I would say insentient, sentient, insentient. I am conscious and mind and body are things I am conscious of. They are objects. So use these three 
the result is you begin to now see our real nature is not a physical nature it's not even a mental nature i am not the physical body i am not even the subtle body physical body dies at death subtle body does not die at death and i do not die at death subtle body also keeps on changing uh, from childhood to old age it keeps on changing from morning till afternoon and night from uh, waking to dreaming to deep sleep the subtle body changes continuously i am the unchanged experience of the subtle body changing subtle body i am ever conscious and the body and mind are what i am conscious of now if you think that's uh, fantastic it's just the beginning now we are beginning to get warmed up in vedanta time and space and causation are in the mind without subtle body without mind we have no experience of time you see time continues whether you experience it or not forget that from your first person perspective it's only when the mind is functioning that we are experiencing time um proof when you when we fall asleep in deep sleep we have no experience of time when we are dreaming we there is time dilation there is an entirely distorted from our waking state entirely different experience of time we may we may say hours and days have gone by in our dreams although they might might have lasted 2 or 3 minutes from the waking perspective there is a famous story of narada and krishna where narada wanted to see what is maya and krishna said go and fetch me water narada goes to a village and there he meets this pretty girl who's drawing water from the village well he falls in love with her proposes to her gets married then they have their children and then he leads a very happy life and then one day um a flood comes and uh, his wife is drowned he loses his children and his so and he's is devastated he's thrown up on the banks of the river and he is weeping bitterly and he looks up and he sees krishna standing there and he says narada where have you been i've been waiting for quite half an hour for the water half an hour and here 30 years of his life have gone by <laughs> that's the dilation of time caused by from waking state to dream state for example and you go further deep sleep state time must have a stop huh shakespeare time stops for you from your conscious from your first person perspective space and time space is also experienced in the mind you say what what do you mean swami i give the example of a monk in the himalayas we were attending classes and the teacher was saying you are the all pervading consciousness and the, the simple monk he said wait a minute it's the simplest questions which are most important and usually children and innocent people which includes monks they which are who are both children and innocent <laughs> they ask the most difficult questions that monk asked you say i am everywhere as consciousness but i am here i'm not even there uh, how can you say i'm everywhere i'm just here i'm not even there how am i everywhere in hindi he said sarvavyapi all pervading how am i sarvavyapi all pervading main yahan hu wahan nahi hu i'm here i'm not there and the answer with the monk was ah but here and there are they not both being experienced in your mind where is here and there yaha aur waha kaha hai the here and there where is it to understand this more clearly think about a dream when you are standing and watching something say oh, i'm watch- looking across the lake in central park and suddenly i wake up i'm sitting on my bed Oh I dreamt all of that all that distance from the, um, the west side of New York to the east side of New York I was watching all that distance was where here uh, was I on the west side and um, uh, uh, seeing the east side no both I on the west side and the east side at a distance the whole thing was in my mind was it not true that's what we experience notice the same thing in the waking state right now all this is experienced in awareness why do we feel located in time and space is only because of our identification with the body i think i am this one certainly the body is located in time and space because i think i am this one i feel located here i feel limited here 
But if you change your perspective to the mind, you will see in the mind you are experiencing a body and a world. It's a little difficult to change the, change the perspective, but not impossible. It's pretty easy. Think of the dream example. You see, it's not at all difficult. Time and space are in the mind. If time and space are in the mind, causation is also in the mind. Causation means cause and effect. Cause comes first, effect comes next, sequential. Sequence requires time. If time is in the mind, causation is also in the mind. If I am not the body and not the mind, I am the witness of body and mind, I am beyond time and space and causation. I am not the real I. I am not limited by time and space and causation. Not limited by time. I have no beginning in time, no birth in time, no creation in time. I have no end in time, no death or destruction in time. I am immortal. The Atman is immortal. I have no limitation in space. Space appears and disappears in me. In my waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Therefore, I am all pervasive. I am not limited in space means I am not located in a particular space. Space is located in me or space appears in me. I am all pervasive. Sarva Vyapi. And further, I am beyond causation. I am neither the effect not created by Big Bang, God or something else. Nor am I the uh, cause. I am not the creator, not the created. Karya Karana Vilakshanatma. The self is beyond cause and effect. Those who are in the Mandukya class you will recognize. We have been struggling with this for the last few um, weeks. Beyond cause and effect. Karya Karana Vilakshanatma. Beyond cause and effect means I am not born of anything else nor is anything born of me. There is no second apart from me. No second, na dvaitam, non-dual, advaitam, non-dual. The Atman, I'll, they use the Sanskrit which is very precise, is desha kala vastu paricheda shunyam. Not limited by space, not limited by time. I said not limited by causation. Upanishad says not limited by Object. That means there is, we are not separate objects. We are one reality appearing as many. So there is no second thing apart from you, the pure consciousness. But I see so many things, millions of people and things. If there is no second thing apart from you, the pure consciousness, then all the millions of things that you see, hear, smell, taste and touch and interact with, love and hate, all of them are not apart from you. You are all of them. I am indeed all of this. This is spiritual. Brahman or Atman is all of this. This is spiritual. Or all of this is an appearance in me. This is Maya. It's all Maya and appearance in me, the consciousness. This is also spiritual. But I am a body-mind separated from all of you, interacting with you, love and hate and samsara, birth and death. This is not spiritual. This is duality. This is samsara. If you think this is grand, wait, next. <laughs> our real nature which is not limited by time hence immortal not limited by space hence all pervasive uh, omnipresent not limited by um, causality or by object hence non-dual there is no second thing apart from me it's in, this is called infinity infinity in the Sanskrit is um, anantam not limited but there can be no two infinities Vivekananda is big on this. There can be no two infinities. Why not? I am one infinite and you are another. Aren't there many infinites in, in mathematics? In mathematics there are many infinites. But remember, the infinity that Vedanta talks about is the one true infinity. Why? Because all other infinites are different from each other. So the infinite set of real numbers or the infinite set of negative numbers and infinite set of positive numbers in mathematics. Both are infinite sets and yet they are different from each other. Uh, the infinite set of real uh, positive numbers does not include ne uh, negative numbers. Vedanta would say in that case it's not a real infinite. There's something which, is, which limits it. Two infinites means I am something and there's something apart from me. Then how am I an infinite? Infinite because the Sanskrit word is, uh, is more precise. Anantam, no limit. If there is something apart from me, then there is a limit to me. There's, there's somewhere where I stop and the other thing starts. Do you see where I'm going with this? 
If there is no limit to me, if I'm truly limitless, there can be only one of me. There cannot be another. So the Atman consciousness, this, this immortal consciousness is only one in all of us. We are all one. Not as rhetoric. We are all the brotherhood or sisterhood of all beings. Not just rhetoric. Literally, really, Vedanta with utmost seriousness says we are one reality. All of us are this one immortal being, consciousness, bliss. He said, Swami, you are smuggling in bliss. Where did the bliss come in from? <laughs> the bliss is here. Because it is infinite, because it is the vast, it is also complete, it stands in need of nothing. When I am identified with the body, I need. I need air to breathe. I cannot exist without a few breaths of air. I need food to eat. I need clothes to protect this body, a shelter for this body. I need nutrition. When I am a mind, I need entertainment and relationships and um, knowledge and education and art and culture. I need. But when I am that infinite in which body and mind appear, grow, change, age, decay and disappear. If I am that consciousness, in that consciousness, what does that one need? Nothing. Nothing. It is complete in itself. It's only when you limit it to a body and mind, the needs come. You can still have a body and mind, but when you are centered in that awareness, then you know deep inside you have no needs. Bill pointed out to me an important statement of Vivekananda, Bill Conrad. He said, uh, Vivekananda's statement is that, remember, I am God is not a statement which is applied to the sense world. To this physical world, from this point of view, I'm a body. From the mental world, I'm a, ma a mind, a personality interacting with other personalities. But the truth is, beyond all of this, all of these appear and disappear in one consciousness, which is my real identity, which never changes. This is our real nature. This is beyond suffering. It is one in all beings. It is not born, it does not die. It is never in bondage. It is ever free. It's free right now. It's the fact that we do not know it is the only bondage. We are not bound by karma. We are not bound by sin. We are not bound by matter or even by thought. We are not bound by our actions also. We are already free. The only thing is to know this and to assert it in our thought, word and action. Already free, never bound. The, in the words of the Mandukya Karika, Gaudapada, na baddho na cha muktaha, na, na sadhaka, na, na utpatti, he says, na nirodho na cha utpatti, there is no uh, cessation of the universe, there is no creation of the universe. Na baddho na cha sadhaka, there is no one who is bound, no one who is a spiritual practitioner trying to get freedom. Na mukta na cha mumukshahu. Not anyone who is freed, enlightened person freed. We say enlightened beings are there. It says no. Nor anyone trying to get freedom. Swami, we are all here trying to get freedom, enlightenment. He says no. None of that. Then what is the truth? Ittiyesha paramarthata. This is the ultimate truth. What is this? Is this, this our real nature? This infinite awareness, infinite existence and forever complete without any want at all. With this in mind, centered in the, this, when we look back upon our little lives and body and mind, when you live out the remaining life of this body and mind, then you are called Jivan Mukta, enlightened, free while living. But a question comes. The question of individuality. We react in fear. There are people who are terrified of this. So wait a minute, I don't want that kind of you know, like oceanic being one with everybody else. I want to be enlightened and free and immortal and all powerful, you know, like Superman or Spider Man or something like that in this body. This individual, I want to continue as uh, Mr. X or Mrs. Y and also be all of what you said. <laughs> Me and mine, first. This one must be uh, glorified. Individuality. The question of individuality. Swami Vivekananda <laughs> is very harsh on this. He says, what individuality? Where is this individuality? Are we individuals yet? 
as this in person. Which is the individual? Is the baby an individual? Would you want to remain as babies? No. Teenagers? God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> Young people, middle aged. Which one is the individual you want to remain as? Body an individual? Are the organs are individual? Organs die. A hand is lost. Is the person gone? No. There's a story of a man who uh, fell in love with this uh, woman. This is a um, story uh, the monks tell. And this uh, lady was a, a wise lady. She looked at the young man and said, um, What is it that you love attracts you to me so much? Oh, your hair is so beautiful. Oh, you like it? Yeah, take it. The, the, the wig. <laughs> he was a little taken aback. Eh? And he said, No, your teeth are so beautiful. Oh, okay, you can take it. And the dentures you take. But there's a point there. This is a conglomeration, ever-changing. Which one is the individual here? There's no individuality in the organs of the body, especially in the modern age. Almost everything is replaceable. <laughs> so which one is the ind individual? Personality. We think we are the person, that's the individual. But the personality is in continuous flux and we read so many cases. One blow to the head, some tumor somewhere. Tremendous change in personality. Alzheimer's. Tremendous change in personality. Memory, our memory. So I am an individual, I have a personal memory, a bio, bio data, bio, biography. But then there are so much of my babyhood I don't remember. So is that not me? Just because I don't remember it? So much of my um, childhood and my teenage life which has sort of gone. I'm sure it's deep down there somewhere, but it's very difficult to recover it now. So am I not that? Memory does not define individuality. And as we age, a stroke or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's can wipe out most of our memory. Oh, the, uh, um, my mother or father has lost all memory, can't recognize me, so the individual is gone. I, I don't want to take care of that person is not anymore my mother or father. Do we ever say that? No. They may not recognize me at all. It's a memory. So we also know deep inside, memory is not the person. Personality is not the person. I, I read the word personality. It comes from the Greek personae, which means when they used to have those, in ancient Greece, when they used to have those dramas, those plays, um, they would go in the amphitheater and they would have these masks. Sona means sound. Persona through which the sound comes. So uh, the actor would recite his or her lines. I don't know if did women act in those days. I'm not sure. They would recite their li lines out loud through that mask. And that mask was called the personae. Personality means the mask we put on or masks we put on. Not us. Even the word personality means it's not you. Where is the individuality? Swami Vivekananda says we are not individuals yet. We are evolving, moving towards individuality. As we spiritually realize ourselves as that one universal identity, as existence consciousness bliss, in that real nature we are truly individual for the first time. He says that's our real nature. In that real nature, that is our individuality. In that oneness is, is, is the individuality with the capital I. You know, sometimes I had a little dilemma. Vivekananda's original words have a unique power. They're like mantras. I'm giving you the gist of what he said. But really, note, I'm just saying individuality is that, uh, that ultimate oneness. You know what he says? He says, the more our life is in the universal, the more immortal we are, the more our life is in the little, the faster we go towards death. Fear of death comes when our life is in the little, in the body, in the mind, then fear of death comes. Recognize the witness behind, live in that oneness of this entire universe, in every life that lives, I live. Not rhetoric, we really feel it. I am one with everything. So in everything that lives, I live. As long as there's one living being in the universe, I'm still living there. Because I'm not identified with one body-mind. That is real individuality. Then the question, um, so this, that is the real nature, our real nature. Then what is the apparent person, this apparent person, this personality? 
It's an expression of that real nature. Question will be, if that is my real nature, then what is this? What is this now? It's an expression, a manifestation, an appearance of that, a limitation of that infinite. It's an expression of that infinite. We are trying to express that infinite through the limited medium of the body-mind. There are lower expressions which we call evil and sinful and bad. There are higher expressions which we call moral and good and noble. And they are the highest expressions which we call spiritual. So we are continuously trying to express it. The question is raised about evolution. See, Swami Vivekananda says that in every culture of the world there is this idea that what we are now is actually a degeneration of our real nature. So the fall of Adam and Eve uh, or in Hindu cosmology the vast cycles, the age of truth, Satya Yoga, uh, Treta Yoga, Dwapar Yoga, the age of iron, Kali Yoga. So this is the, like the worst age to live in. But it's a degeneration. Modern evolution says no, it's just the opposite. Uh, we have evolved from um, prim primitive beings to more and more sophisticated beings. So how do you deal with the question of evolution? That's the central uh, charge, the central uh, plank of the modern atheists today. Whether it's Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris or um, the late Christopher Hitch Hitchens, the main plank of argument against religion is evolution. We, material evolution explains how life has evolved from prim pr primitive forms to this human being. And we don't need any kind of spiritual explanation for that. It can explain itself. Swami Vivekananda gives the Vedantic uh, response to that. He says that he calls it the evolution of nature and the appearance of the absolute. That absolute reality, Brahman or, or Atman, is shining forth as this universe. And this universe is evolving. From the primitive uh, matter to life, uh, to higher forms of life, that evolution is there. Sanskrit, it's, it's a, a very old Vedantic doctrine. The original Sanskrit is very precise. Brahma vivarta prakriti parinama. Brahma vivarta prakriti parinama. What does it mean? An appearance of Brahman. Like the rope appearing as the snake. Rope has not become the snake. Brahman or the ultimate reality has not become the universe. It's not pantheism. Uh, it, God has not actually become tables and chairs. And No. It shines forth as this universe. And within this universe, evolution and everything is accepted. All the laws of science. You see, that's one of the greatest attractions of Vedanta. It does not conflict with science and reason. All the laws of science operate within nature. But the whole of it is what? It's an appearance in consciousness which you are. So nature evolves and Brahman or the Atman, you, shine forth. The evolution of nature, it just reveals the real uh, self within more and more. Swami Vivekananda gives this example. I can imagine him standing in front of an audience like this and he's saying, here I am. Imagine a screen is put in front of me and there's only a small hole. I can see a few faces. These are his exact words. As the screen is rent wider and wider, more of you come into view. And when the screen is gone fully, I can see the whole vista. Not that you, st you are created or you appear. You are already there. More and more was manifested, more and more was revealed until it was perfect. Similarly, the Satchidananda, you, the Atman, you are revealing yourself in this nature. And nature is evolving. You are not evolving. You are perfect already. Better and better mirrors come and reflect your perfection better and better. The mirrors are evolving. The face is not evolving. So, evolution of nature and appearance of the absolute. Ma uh, Prakriti Parinama or Maya Parinama and Brahma Vibhartha in Sanskrit. Now a question arises. Almost the last, I promise. <laughs> How much he could pack into one talk, I was just imagine. Uh, and uh, all without microphones. He would walk back and forth on the um, stage and talk. What is the utility of all of this? What good does it do? First, Vivekananda's answer. 
his answer is, first of all, why should it have any utility? Truth is truth. In those days, electricity was um, uh, the latest invention. So if a baby asks, what good is electricity? Will it give me lollipops? <laughs> no. <laughs> truth is truth and should be uh, learned and accepted and realized for its own sake. But then he goes on. Having said that, there is the greatest utility in this. There is the greatest utility in this. Remember the questions we had started with. Death. Happiness. What is the solution? What is the salvation theory according to the philosopher Luke Ferry? What does Vedanta say? This realization takes you forever beyond death. Indeed, it shows you you cannot die. You have never died. Never have you been born with the birth of the body, nor did you ever die with the death of the body. No matter how many bodies you have taken up and how many bodies have gone. Happiness. Your happiness does not depend on the little satisfactions the world can provide. Your happiness does not depend on the handouts that the world can provide. You are not here to beg for pleasure from the world. You are here to give. You are ever complete. Not as rhetoric. Look inside. Not to the body. Not to the mind. But beyond the mind, the witness consciousness in itself. Is it not perfect? Is it not complete? What does it need? What do you need? Rather, being fulfilled, being complete, we are here in this life so that we give and we serve. This is the solution. Swami Vivekananda says, identified with the little terror comes. And we go through life like, like he says, hunted animals, chased through life. Anxious, scared, what will hit us next? Financial problem, health problem, parking problem, what will hit us next? We run through life like hunted animals, unfulfilled, terrorized, because we, are, we think we are little, little bodies and minds. The problem is solved at one go, at one blow, when you realize yourself as this Atman, the, the uh, infinite consciousness, the absolute beyond body and mind. This is the great utility. In Vedantic terms, complete transcendence of sorrow. I'm using words carefully. Transcendence. It's not an anesthetic. And that if pain is there, you put, take a medicine and pain will go away. No, you transcend. It is there and yet you are not affected by it. You find a greater dimension within yourself, which is not affected by the physical or mental trauma this world inflicts. Complete transcendence of sorrow and attainment of ultimate bliss. Atyantika dukkha nivritti paramananda praptischa. This is, the, this is the promise. This is the utility. And this again is the utility, Vivekananda's words. If even a few, a small portion of the world's humanity, men and women today, realize this truth, really realize it, and manifest it in life, this world would be turned into a heaven on earth. Where would be this fierce cutthroat competition, this dissatisfaction, this fear and terror of the other, this, this unwillingness to share, the beautiful ideals the United Nations is founded on. It would become an easy job, not continuous uh, conflict. That we are one. See, those ideals are all reflections of this Atman ideal. That we are truly one. Not being forced to be one. We realize ourselves as one. If a f even a small section of humanity would be able to realize this. Not going to happen, but it's... <laughs> but it is the utility. The more we... We uh, realize this in life and express it in our day-to-day -day life, in thinking, in speaking, and in doing, and the more societies change for the better. The solutions we are looking for, they are here. The deeply, in, in, in the, the underlying spiritual truths common to all the religions of the world, which Vedanta puts forth so beautifully, so clearly. Ethics. Why should I be good? Vivekananda again says, and herein lies the reason why you should be good. I'll give a talk later on someday on a separate subject, Swami Vivekananda's theory of ethics. Swami Vajananji wrote a 25-page article on that. Um, fantastic. Very quickly, why should I be good? The utilitarian theory says maximize happiness. So maximize happiness, I can maximize my own happiness at the cost of others or my own community's happiness at the cost of others or my own nation's happiness at the cost of other nations. Why not? 
Utilitarian theory tells me it is true. You can do that. Or suppose there is what is called the deontological theory. I'll explain all that in the next le promised lecture. <laughs> but the, it says, uh, why should I be good? Because the law say, says it. I can break the law. Why should I be good? Because the religious book says it. My book doesn't say it. Your book may say it. I may not believe in your book. All the theories of ethics have this, this problem. They call it that you cannot, that uh, in, in uh, philosophical language, axiology or values is not grounded in ontology or, or the real. What is real here, can you derive your ethics from it? Modern science says no. Science is ethically neutral. Sam Harris has written a book trying to say how you can derive ethics from science. doesn't work. Robert Wright has written a book, The Moral Animal, where he does the opposite. All the things which seem to be ethical, now he shows they're actually, there's a Darwinian evolution working underneath that. <laughs> In Vedanta, you find the ontological ground of ethics. To put it simply, these are my words, not Vivekananda never used <laughs> such complex words. He, sa he just simply said, the ground of ethics, the ethics is, we are one. Why should I not cut my neighbor's throat if it, if, it, um, if it is to my advantage? Because we are one. If I harm the least amongst you, I'm harming myself. We are one reality. As I work for fulfilling my own goals, making myself happy, the enlightened person sees that I have to do that for the entire community because I am the entire community. Even selfishness there comes with a capital S, that you realize we are one, one existence. This is the surest foundation for ethics. He says in every religion, ethics is self-abnegation, where the self is sacrificed, smaller self is sacrificed for the whole. If you seriously think about it, how much of the wealth and facilities that we have do we truly need or truly deserve? Why should I deprive even the least of people outside who are suffering, uh, why should I have more than anybody else? I'll just leave you with a hint. So Vivekananda mentions this, but Derek Parfit, who passed away a um, few, I think last year, uh, Parfit, P-A-R-F-I-T, if you look him up, he's not well known in the public. Among philosophers, he's regarded as probably the most significant philosopher in the Western world in the last um, 50 years. He passed away. He was in uh, Oxford, I think. Um, his entire work was on ethics, most of it, and it was very uh, similar to a Buddhistic idea of the self. Uh, but his work on ethics was self-abnegation, that there is logically, if you look at it, there is no way to justify accumulation for one person. Uh, that since we are literally the same, then everybody has a right to it that the community has a greater right to it than I personally have, and so on. So self-abnegation, sacrifice of this lower self for the greater self, that flows directly from the Vedantic idea of ethics. In Bhajananji's article, it's called Swami Vivekananda's Ontological Ethics, how he has grounded, gr uh, grounded ethics in Vedanta. Final question, is it practical? Is it practical? Can it be done? People say it's too difficult. Swami Vivekananda was just of the opposite thing. And not only is it not difficult, it can be done, it must be done. Our own unhappiness, our, the terror of death will drive us towards it. Here is the solution. He says, fill your mind with the highest thoughts, the noblest thoughts, day and night, keep this before you. He says, there is too much too much stress on action in America. In India, he said, do something. <laughs> in America, he said, there's too he literally, he said, there's too much stress on action. Thought first. And I was reminded of something I saw. It says, don't just do something. Think. The reverse of what we normally say. Don't just think. Do something. Is Don't just do something. Think. And Vivekananda says that. First, fill your mind with the noblest and highest thoughts. Then action will come from that. And the greatest and noblest and unselfish action will come from the mind filled with such thoughts. We have hypnotized ourselves into littleness. I must tell you the story which Vivekananda loved. He told it in this talk that there was a lion cub who was born and when in giving birth the mother, the lioness died and the cub fell in the midst of sheep. 
and it, it it was brought up by the sheep and grew up thinking it was sheep a, la a lamb or something and it started eating grass and moved, making friends with the little sheep years later it was fully grown a big lion came hunting it was astonished to see in the midst of the sheep a fully grown lion who was eating grass and so this lion stalked that young lion and um, chased it and jumped on it and grabbed it and this uh, young the sheep lion the young lion was so terrified, he started bleating. He said, let me go, you're scaring me, you're scaring me. And he said, no, you are not sheep, you are a lion. Um, he said, no, I'm not, no sir, you're scaring me, let me go. Let me go back to my friends. And he was bleating. And this big old lion dragged him to the um, pool of water and said, look at my reflection. He got even more scared, oh my God, it's terrifying. Now look at your own reflection. Looks and says, see, you are a lion as much as I am. Roar like me. And you realize that I am a lion. And so are we. We are spending so much time with the sheep of body and uh, organs and mind and the littleness and the, the material nature. We have reduced ourselves to materiality, to material nature. We are the lion of the spirit. We are pure consciousness, immortal. Nothing can touch us. Nothing ever has, nothing ever will. This entire life is an expression of our glory. So with that spirit, realizing that I am that lion of Vedanta, uh, let us live this life. Swami Vivekananda says, tell yourself again and again, I am he, I am he, so hum, so hum. I am that, I am that Brahman, I am that Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi, Aham Brahmasmi. Tell yourself again in happiness and in misery, at the point of death, tell yourself I am Brahman. If you have realized it, if you have seen, if you have understood it, it's a fact for you and you are in bliss. If you have not understood it, even just telling yourself that, bringing to mind these teachings, it's such a tonic. I remember a great Swami whom I joined under. He used to serve Swami Premeshananda, who was a disciple of the Holy Mother. And that Swami was regarded as an enlightened person, but he was very sick towards the end of his life. And one night this old Swami was lying in the bed and the young monk who was serving him saw that the old Swami was groaning with pain. And he said, I didn't know what to do. And I asked the Swami, what can I do to lessen your suffering? And the Swami said, get out Swami Vivekananda's Jnana Yoga. Switch on the light and start reading. And he starts reading. And the Swami goes into a deep and restful, I don't know, sleep or meditation or quiet. No, all sign of pain goes away from him. Now what, what, was, what, what was happening there? That Swami knows the real nature. He just needs a little reminder. Like Sri Ramakrishna would need a little reminder to go into Samadhi. Somebody closed an umbrella in front of him and his mind went into Samadhi. <laughs> Gathering in the mind, you know, closing an umbrella. <laughs> and his mind goes into Samadhi, absorbed in the self within. He transcends pain by centering himself in the real nature. Tell yourself again and again, I am that self. Vivekananda concludes with his famous exhortation, Arise, awake and stop not till the goal is reached. It's from the Katopanishad. The original mantra is, Uttishthata jagrata prapya vara nibodhata Kshurasya dhara nishita duratvaya Durgam pathastat kavayo vadanti Arise, the commentator Shankara, so beautiful, he says, O sentient being, he's calling us, O sentient being, arise from the beginningless sleep of Maya. Awaken, awaken into your real nature as the pure consciousness. Prapya varan nibodhata is, how do you do that? Go to those great teachers who can give you this knowledge. Nibodhata, become enlightened. That Vivekananda adapted into, arise, awake and stop not till the goal is reached. The next part is also interesting. I'll end with that. Kshurasya dhara nishita aduratya. Kshurasya dhara means the path is like the razor's edge. This is what Somerset Mom in his book. So the beginning of the bo book he quotes from this verse. Katha Upanishad. He says the path is as narrow and sharp as the razor's edge. And that's the name of the book, the razor's edge. Kshurasya dhara nishita aduratya. Durgam Patastat Kavayo Vadanti, the great sages. Even the name for the sages is so beautiful. It calls them the great poets. The great poets say the path is difficult. It's because it's so subtle. 
So that's why you need the teachers, you need the knowledge to realize our own nature. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astu I pray to Sri Ramakrishna, the Holy Mother, Swami Vivekananda, all the great ones of all the religions, great, great sp- masters of spirituality throughout history, may they bless us that this knowledge may dawn in our lives in this very life itself.